Well, we'll start with the ancient history with regards to the family. And this dates back to the year 1573 and the arrival of an English soldier, Sir Hugh Clotworthy. He obtained the lease of the land Mazarine from Lord Chichester and settled over here shortly after. Along with him came his young wife, Lady Marian Langford, who famously was rescued by an Irish wolfhound from an attack on the shores of Loch Ney, a wolf attack. During this attack, she lost consciousness and came to a little while later to find one of the wolves lying dead and standing over her, her Irish wolfhound saviour, licking its wounds. So she became really closely bonded to this wolfhound and nursed it back to health over the next few weeks. And a short time later, the wolfhound disappeared, never to be seen or heard of again. But word spread of Lady Marion's wolfhound saviour. And one day, very early in the morning, it was still dark, the deep baying of an Irish wolfhound awakened one of the castle attendants. He had enough time being alerted by the wolfhound to prepare and fire a single cannon shot in the general direction of a group of 60 enemy men who were busy advancing rather rapidly on the castle from the southern side of the six mile water. By hearing the wolfhound, this afforded him enough time to stop the attack on the castle, on the resins. This then became the second time that the wolfhound had saved a member of the family, and so you clot where he went to great lengths to conceal the fact that he had commissioned the carving of the very same uh, stone statue that you'll find in Clotworthy Courtyard. Hugh Clotworthy and Lady Marion Langford went on to have a son, John Clotworthy. It was John who was created the first Viscount Mazarin. Along with the title of Viscount Mazarin came a special remainder. It was able to pass on to an heiress, onto a daughter. And this happened straight away with his daughter who inherited the title of Viscount Mazarin in her own right. She married a fellow by the name of John Skeffington, the second Viscount Mazarin, who was responsible for implementing the gardens. By this time, mid-1600s, Antrim Castle was finished um, being built, the, all, all the original phases of building, and he could turn his attention to the areas surrounding the castle. So he developed the gardens, and what we have today are the remains of these gardens that he had designed and, and built. Um, they're Anglo-Dutch water gardens and they're very historically significant because we're one of only three gardens remaining of this time period and this genre in the entire British Isles and, and Ireland. They all tend to focus on straight paths, lines of symmetry and ordering nature. So there's no natural embellishments back in the 16 and 1700s with formal garden styles. It was necessary to display your wealth and social standing and your control over nature back then. 200 years later, garden trends kind of changed into a, towards a much more romantic sort of theme after Capability. Brown's influences right through the Victorian era, uh, the emphasis was placed very strongly on Mother Nature once again. And paths would wind around trees, undulating terrain and follies and tunnels was uh, the order of the day in Victorian gardens a lot more romantic and less formal than the original Anglo-Dutch water gardens that were created over here. Clotworthy House was built as a very grand stable block in the mid-1800s by the 10th Viscount Mazarin. At this point, the demolition of the old stable block was carried out. Clotworthy House, being a rather grand stable block, got an equally grand architect to design it for them, Charles Lanyon. Now, Charles Lanyon is famed for uh, designing the Crumlin Road Jail and brilliant buildings like Queen's University. Somewhat strange that he'd agree to do a stable block. But the Lanyons and the Skeffingtons were close family friends, and who knows, he may have even done this just in return for a favour, or maybe as a favour. The mere fact that the grotesques are incorporated into the front of Clotworthy House, the image of a male head and a female head on either side, suggests that there was good rapport between the family and Lanyon. The story of the grotesques is uh, somewhat amusing. The gentleman on the left, the story goes, was born blind. Because of this blindness, he was finding it really hard to meet a lady love. He was desperate for love and spent many a year searching and hoping that he would find true love. 
One day, met a lady, and not being able to see her, believed exactly what she told him. She had told him, in no uncertain terms, how incredibly lucky he had been to bump into her because he had just met the most beautiful lady in the whole area. And who was he to doubt her honesty or her sincerity? So they started courting, and after a very short courtship, he married her and spent every day of his married life listening to her tell him just how beautiful she was and spent every day of his married life also wishing that just for a brief moment he could regain his eyesight to fully appreciate his wife's true beauty. One day he woke up and his wish had come true, he could see. He turned around, took one look at her, closed his eyes and spent the rest of his life wishing that he couldn't. An amusing story like this from Lanyon to the family suggests a rather close friendship or good rapport at the very least. Now with regards to the fire, on the 28th of October 1922, a few guests were over at the castle. Um, these were mostly military men and some ladies, and the total amount of people in the castle would have, would have been 25, maybe 30 on the outside. Certainly not the grand ball that you will hear of on many accounts with the burning of Antrim Castle. There was no grand ball and it was a fairly somber affair just with a few dinner guests. The night's proceedings, as I said, would have been a fairly orderly affair with perhaps dinner and after dinner, the men would have retreated to one room, the ladies to another to play bridge and possibly solve the problems of the world around a glass or two of whiskey and a couple of cigars. And this was definitely the case on the evening where uh, the women retreated to play bridge and the men uh, sat in the library discussing political matters. I refer to some extracts from different accounts that came out in court for a year after the fire. And on all accounts, it is mentioned that the whole party would have retired to bed at between 12 and 12.30 in the evening. Lord Mazarin himself stayed down for a little longer to tend to the fires. Four fires had been lit in various fireplaces that night. Three had been allowed to burn out, and the only fire still smouldering was the ingle nook. Viscount Mazarin then brushed the coals in the ingle nook. He pulled the sofa away off of the hearth that they had moved earlier in the evening to get the last remaining heat from the fire burning out. Then he retired to bed himself. It was probably three hours after this that the flames were first discovered. What happened during those three hours, no one knows. The first account in court was Lady Mazarin, his wife, uh, where she um, recalls waking from her slumber and hearing footsteps outside in the corridor. She thought to herself she ought to go have a look, but she was really sleepy and she drifted off back to sleep without satisfying her curiosity. And a little while later, she heard Colonel Richardson, who was the family's agent, Lord Mazarin's agent, running up and down the corridor, banging on doors, shouting, there's a fire, they're in down below. At this point, Lady Mazarin grabs her revolver and runs out of the building to check on her children, who were just down the corridor in the nursery. And she finds that they're okay, and while comforting them, gets trapped in the room by the flames. Colonel Richardson then runs in and rescues them with the aid of bed sheets being tied together and lowering them down out of the window onto a lower roof. Simultaneously, while this is happening, Lord Mazarin is running around frantically trying to get downstairs so that he can assess the state of the fire, but the main stairwell of the house is ablaze, can't get downstairs at all. He mentions that he used a hidden staircase, the spiral staircase, which we think may have been housed by the Italian Tower, which is the last remaining piece of Antrim Castle that wasn't demolished in, uh, in 1970. What he discovers is, according to his account, is three individual fires, which in his mind would have been unlikely to have spread from the original fire that had been lit, suggesting maybe that three individual fires had been lit. He then tried to extinguish some of the main flames by turning one of the hydrants and hoses on, but alas, no water was available to him and he got but a mere trickle. This was very strange. Earlier that day, he had ordered the cisterns to be filled to overflowing, which they were. 
So at some point between the cisterns being overflowing, and at this point they would have held 1,800 gallons of water, and now not even a trickle was available. So in the space of three or four hours, the cisterns had run completely dry. So there were many facts which the family put forward indicating possible political foul play. The lack of availability of water would have been one of the main facts. The fact that it seemed as three fires had been lit. Also, there was a large amount of paraffin oil that had gone missing. Six gallons of paraffin oil had gone missing earlier that day. Um, no sign of that paraffin oil or of any container. But after the fire, upon investigations and inspections, large stains were seen splattered on some of the salvaged furniture, which looked like mineral oil stains or paraffin oil stains. Also, an oily residue was visible on a lot of the furniture from the smoke, suggesting that oil and not fuel had been used as a catalyst. Furthermore, it had been very strange that the military guard of B Specials, which had been guarding the castle, had been withdrawn just 10 days prior to the fire. Lord Mazarin himself had tried to get the guard reinstated, but it failed. So the castle had been left unguarded for 10 days before the fire. Another very interesting fact which may suggest motive or political foul play was that Jean, Lady Mazarin, had received three death threats in the year leading up to the fire. One, the most recent of these death threats, read that she would need to prepare to meet her maker, which I suppose would have been quite unsettling for the family. So much so that she had told her husband at the 12th fire count about the first two, but not the last one in fear that he would send her away to England for her safety. The picture is painted in that there were a lot of very fishy facts. A lot of facts which would suggest political motives, um, which would suggest foul play. There was a member of staff who had his bags packed and ready to go, and that in itself would maybe suggest a possible inside job. But at every point through the court case, which stretched out for most of 1923, at every point there was a reasonable doubt injected. So the cisterns holding 1,800 gallons of water may have been run dry as a result of the fire damaging the water pipe and the water escaping the system that way. The oil could have been put down to, again, oil lamps that had been used and it exploded in the flames and oil had splattered around the rooms that way, maybe further worsening the state of the fire. There was also the ingle nook, which was a topic of its own investigation through the court case. And there's very contradictory statements surrounding the Ingle Nook and its state of repair. Was it in good condition or were there indeed wooden beams that maybe would have been at close proximity to any fire lit in the Ingle Nook? So on the night of the fire, it would have been absolutely horrific. Uh, we have cases of people jumping out of windows two and three stories above the ground. Miss Grace Darcy, the daughter of the Lord Primate at the time, had to jump out of her bedroom window. She was stuck in her room and she was commended afterwards for bravery, for jumping out of her window and making such a brave escape. Lord Mazarin himself helped some maids, some, some servant girls out of the castle and a mention to two very brave local Antrim men, Samuel Hannon and John Heaney from Riverside and Church Street in Antrim. These two men were of different politics, different beliefs, and they got together and with the aid of very tall ladders, 20 foot high, assisted in carrying three or four servants out from the top story windows. One of them, Ethel Gilligan, sadly passed away later that night due to the effects of asphyxiation. But these two men received gallantry awards for their efforts and life-saving actions on the night of the fire. Unfortunately, a very horrific incident, the night of the fire, which ends in no payment to the family. And despite significant evidence to support the various accounts and theories of malice or arson, there was also an insufficient proving of some of these claims, which did not negate all reasonable doubt. And as a result, many questions remain unanswered, and it is left up to each of us to surmise for ourselves what actually happened that night.